Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Banking and Consumer Affairs Tuesday, March 7th, 2023, uh, where it's better to be uninformed than misinformed. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Representatives Barrett, Bricken, Here. Camper, Here. Faison, Present. Garrett, yep. Lynn, Here. Sparks, Vaughn, Here. Chairman Powers. Here. Chairman Powers, you have a quorum. <laughs> And uh, now I have an announcement too, because we just wanted to let everybody know our final calendar for this committee uh, will be on March the 21st, two weeks from today. Uh, got to put the bills on notice by Wednesday, March the 15th. So if you've got anything to go on notice, they need to get them in. And now we have some uh, housekeeping items, or as my wife calls them, a honeydew list. Uh, item number three, House Bill 1185 by Representative Garrett has been rolled for one week. Um, item number five, House Bill 650 by Re Representative McCallum has been rolled for one week. And now, are there any personal orders or personal problems or anything that uh, we need to come before, <laughs> need to come before the committee? <coughs> Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's actually a personal privilege for me, maybe a personal problem for my son, but my son, Reagan, is here, and it's just nice to have him in committee. This is him over here, Reagan Faison. Y'all make him feel welcome. Glad to have you. I've seen him before. Uh, anybody else before we get started? If not, uh, the first bill on the calendar today is House Bill 396 by Representative Gant. And is he here? I don't know. Yeah, roll to the hill. Okay. Rolling to the hill. Okay, second bill we have on the calendar is Representative Reedy. And I got a motion and a second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a an amendment we need to put on. The uh, tracking uh, number is 4612. Okay, wait a minute. Just one moment. I need to, I've got a different number here. Had the right one a minute ago. Just a moment. We got it. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion on the amendment? Motion. And a second? Okay. And would you like to explain the amendment? It is, is, it is, it's a technical correction, Mr. Chairman, if we can just go ahead and put it on. Question's been called. All in favor of putting the amendment uh, 4612 on, please say aye. aye. All opposed? The amendment goes on. And now if you'll explain the bill as amended. Quickly, it's a uh, Senator Wally's bill that he brought to me, but I'll, I'll read for the record. It requires a financing company doing business in this state to provide on its mailed or emailed statements to a consumer a conspicuously displayed telephone number that a consumer may contact for service establishes a violation of such in an unfair or deceptive act or practice under the Consumer Protection Act of 1977. Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. And do we have any uh, questions for on the bill anywhere? You have one? Uh, Chairman Vaughn. Thank you. And uh, Representative Reedy, I apologize I didn't get a chance to, to talk to you before that, before this time. The, could you give me a specific incidence where someone has been mistreated or, or in why we need to, to do this? Because I I tend to, I mean, m having this, I'm trying to figure out where the bill came, originated. Yeah, uh, Chairman Reedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and mm -hmm. Chairman Vaughn, what happened with uh, Senator Wally is constituents coming to him that were elderly, and they, they had questions or concern about a bill, and they were looking, <clears> trying <throat> to figure out who to contact, and they could not find a phone number uh, to do so, and, and that's the purpose of the bill. All right. Well, Chairman Bond. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. The I have I've been approached by by folks that are that have having some technical issues with this, and and I'm sorry that. I, but but would you be you wouldn't root would it mess you up to roll this a week and let us consider a couple of amendments so that we the subcommittee can hear them and I and 
if, if not, I understand that, and that's shame on me. But if, if we need to, I, it would be, I would appreciate it just because I want to try to address some of the concerns from some of the people who do send their invoicing and all through, through the mail that there might be some unintended consequences in here. Because your purpose, I understand, man. I can't stand it whenever there's not a phone number for me to, even if they're in India, I want to call and holler at somebody in India if I've got a problem with my bill. And so I, I understand the driving force from, but I think there might be some massaging that we can do that might eliminate some of the folks' concerns about it. Chairman Reed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And of course, where, where I tell people when it's the Senator's bill, I could certainly roll it, but if you or whomever does not talk to the Senator for that uh, uh, permission for, for an amendment, I, I just run it as it is until they, the, the Senate sponsor tells me Okay. likewise. Understood. Chairman Vaughn. Understood. Okay. So, so I, I'm okay with rolling it for one week, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> We're uh, House Bill 406, rolled one week. Thank you, Chairman of the Committee. Without objection. Ah, roll one week. Hmm. Okay, we're going to go out of order and take Representative Gant. Since we had rolled him to the hill, we're going to roll him back up if, without objection. Representative Gant, you are recognized on House Bill 396. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. Uh, this uh, legislation was brought to... Senator Wally and I from a couple of constituents that are in our district where their uh, spouse was killed uh, on the job and so it kind of hits home in my district, this piece of legislation Sorry. and this is where it um, originated. Uh, the amendment... Uh, okay, uh, I have two amendments, uh, is that correct? Yeah, both make the bill. Okay. You want to, uh, let's address the amendment. The first one we have is, uh, what's the first one you have, 4512? That is correct. Okay. So we need a motion and a second on the amendment. Motion. Get a motion and a second. All in favor of putting uh, Amendment 4512 on the bill, please say aye. aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, amendment 4512 is on. Now, amend now amendment um, number... Zero zero four seven six four, seven. Four seven six seven is what I have. All in favor of putting that amendment on, please say aye. aye. All opposed. And that amendment goes on. Amendment four seven six seven. So we have both amendments on the bill. Now please uh, talk about the bill as it has been. Thank amended. you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what this does is this. This is called the uh, Garrison Jordan Survivor Benefits Act, which is named after the uh, survivors. Uh, where their husband, uh, both spouses were um, killed. And what this does is this increases the maximum weekly workers' compensation death benefit to, the, to a surviving spouse with no dependent child or one dependent orphan from 50% to the 66.67% uh, of the employee's average weekly wage. And it also removes the uh, marriage penalty um, uh, as a terminating event regarding the workers' compensation uh, concerning death benefits. Okay, thank you for that explanation. Any questions for the sponsor? Anywhere? Okay, if not, uh, yes, I'm sorry, uh, Chairman Bricken. That, that Representative Gant. That is correct. Any other questions for the sponsor? Okay, if not, we're going to be voting on um, House Bill 396 as amended. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Down. House Bill 396 is going to Commerce Full. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Thank you. Oh, yes. We need to roll both of those amendments into one. Uh, is there any objection to doing that as it goes to full? Ms. Gavlin? Done. Okay. Uh, third bill is Representative Darby. Uh, Representative Darby on House Bill 633. Got a motion and a second. And we got one amendment, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, code on the amendment is 004932. Uh, that's what we have. Uh, motion on the amendment. Do we have one? Motion. Okay. Do we have a second? We've got a motion and a second. Question Almost didn't one. get it. Yeah. Okay. And would uh, the amendment goes on? And would you like to explain the bill as amended? Yes, sir. House Bill 633 protects the 10 care population from predatory sales of unnecessary products sold under the guise of protecting them from those from the expense they will never actually incur. Our ambulance memberships are sold to individuals with the purpose of protecting them from out-of-pocket expenses incurred upon receipt of an air ambulance transport. 10 care recipient recipients have no deductibles or copays, yet are still targeted by bad actors in this industry who use the threat of financial ruin and the off chance that the recipient need an air transport. This bill would prohibit a company from knowingly sell a membership to a 10, 10 care recipient. Do we have any questions for the sponsor? I, I've, I've got one then, uh, if you don't mind. What, what is the penalty if they do, and, and, how do we, and how do we determine whether they knowingly or unintentionally it's sell at the, it's at the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. It's at the discretion of the AG. There was some teeth in this at the beginning, and uh, they both worked together there to take the teeth out of it, so it's up to the Attorney General. And uh, they give them a little bit of leeway there knowingly, uh, unknowingly, if they sign somebody up and then they find out that they, they are a 10, 10 care recipient, mm -hmm. they've got 30 days to get the refund. After the 30 days, there will, be, will not be a refund. Oh, okay. okay, okay, thank you. That answers my, anybody else? Okay, if not, uh, we're gonna be voting on uh, House Bill, I'm sorry, just missed it, 633. As amended, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. And you're headed to uh, full commerce too. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman and committee. Okay, the, uh, the next bill is by a committee member Representative Bauer, you are recognized on House Bill 637. Do we have a motion? Motion. And a second. Thank you, and Mr. Chairman. We have it and uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, House Bill 637 provides protection for employees for any adverse action that might be taken by an employer when an employee raises a religious exemption for, to a requirement for immunizations. Okay, thank you. And uh, for that explanation, any questions for the sponsor? Oh, I object. I'll withdraw. Yes. We have questions where? Oh, I'm sorry. Leader Camper, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't fully paying attention when you gave the explanation, so that's my fault. Uh, uh, is this bill... Um, dealing with uh, religious exemption as to why someone wouldn't be vaccinated. What, could you just repeat it again? I think I missed it. I'm sorry. Mr. Chairman. Representative Barrett. I'm sorry. Yes, Leader Camper. This bill would provide protection for an employee from any adverse action that might be taken by an employer if the employee raises their religious exemption to a requirement that they have vaccination status. Leader Camper. So if, if I'm an employee and based on my religious, um, ex, uh, based on my religion, I want to be exempted. And so if I am exempted, then, and something happens, then there's no recourse on me because I had this exemption. Is, is that what you're saying? Representative Barrett. That is, that is correct, partially correct. Essentially what this is, is trying to protect from in situations where an employer might take adverse action against someone who refuses to get a vaccine, when the employer is requiring that as a condition of continued employment or from hiring them. So this would provide protection to that employee or potential employee from any adverse action that the employer might take. Okay. I, Leader Kemper. Okay, I'm sorry, I understand it better now. Uh, is there anything in the legislation, I was trying to pull it up, the reason I didn't hear you at first, 
Um, is there anything in there that um, would give another employee um, some protections if they are, if you didn't because of your religious exemption, if you infected that person potentially, do they have any recourse that other person uh, that may have been affected some kind of way? Representative Barrett. I don't know. I'm just asking Th this question. bill does not specifically address do. that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Chairman Bricken is up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly, uh, I certainly fully support our citizens' right to refuse vaccines for religious rights. But I thought we put a lot of this to bid back when we did our original COVID legislation. And, and I know it's been raised, the, the biggest issue is dealing with hospitals and um, um, businesses that receive federal dollars and are required because of who knows what to, um, to, to, um, to follow some of this stuff. So I just don't know <clears throat> if the bill is going to be blanket for everyone or, or there's some, going to be some exemptions that would still tie back into the legislation, the COVID legislation that we did, whatever, two years ago. So maybe if you can help me out there. Representative Baer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the question. The, the legislation that was taken uh, the action that was taken during COVID-19 was specifically referring to the COVID-19 vaccine. This expands those protections for the employee beyond just the COVID-19 vaccine. And in subsection D of the draft, it says notwithstanding subsection C, a healthcare provider does not violate this section if reasonable accommodation measures are implemented and provided to a person who files a statement of religious objection in order to protect the safety and health of other persons from communicable diseases. So there is a, an exception already written in for healthcare providers. Thank you. And Chairman Vaughn. Yeah, this uh, this has been one that I've, well, there's been a lot of contact given to me about this. And I just want to make my committee, fellow committee members understand the slippery slope that this begins. We're telling a private business what they can and cannot do in their employee relations. That's what we're, we're saying. You can spend tens of thousands of dollars to train someone and you invest in these employees, and yet they don't. This is, this is, as I read it, any vaccine. So if I'm a construction company, I can't require my workers to have a tetanus shot if they say they have a religious exemption. And, and I'm sorry, and, and this, this is not me trying to be funny, but I haven't read, I don't know what the biblical basis for a religious exemption is with regards to vaccinations. I don't understand that. I, I've, um, I'm certainly not the biblical scholar that, that many others are, but I try to use that as a guide for my life, and I haven't seen that. And so what, it, what I'm concerned about is employees using this as a reason not to follow an employee mandate, because this is not about their personal liberty, because you're not, no one is coercing you to work at a place of business. That is a decision as a free person you are making for yourself. And if, if requirements for a business owner, they say, you know what, I think this is best for my employees and this is best for my business. And I'm not talking about the COVID stuff. The COVID stuff we dealt with and I have, you know, I got exempted from some things because of the COVID vaccine. Made me mad. But I didn't feel like that I needed the government to go in and beat down the people who chose to exercise their choices in that matter. And so as I look at this, it's like, you know, where do we stop with regards to running other people's business for them? Well, if the person says, you know what, I'm not going to do that because I don't think it's best for my health or the health of my family. I don't think it works. I think the MRNA is bad. Or if I think that there's other uh, contents to some uh, vaccines that I don't agree with the methodology in which they're developed. I understand that, but you have a choice then to go somewhere else to work. And 
it, it seems like as we get into the world of business, you know, it, it's like, what, what's next? Are we going to mandate that Chick-fil-A sell hamburgers because we have an allergy to chicken? I mean, it, I don't, this is just a very frightening slope that one, it, and I know that it's being made in the, and whenever you put religious uh, exemptions or religious beliefs behind it, that does provide some sort of hedge of protection for the argument. But stripping out this, we're, this bill is asking this committee to go into places of business and allow their employees to tell them what they're going to do and what they're not going to do. And if that's the business we want to be in, then so be it. That's the will of the committee. But I have grave concerns about this the way it sits now. Representative Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to address this in different pieces. First of all, with regards to the religious exemption and raising a religious exemption, I think it, it's narrow-minded to look at this strictly through a biblical view, as there are multiple religions that we have to address that, that exist throughout the state of Tennessee, many of which have different tenets than just the Christian religion. So that being said, I, I don't want to get into a biblical argument with you either. Uh, I'd probably lose anyway. Um, secondly, when it comes to regulating businesses and how the businesses interact with their employees, that's exactly what we do. That's what we've been elected to do. That's what the legislature is here for. When you have a balance that we're trying to strike between the individual liberty of an employee versus the individual liberty of an employer, that's what, what our job is, is to try to find what the right balance is between those two so that the scales don't get tipped too far in one direction or the other. So I would submit to the chairman that that's exactly what we're here to do. And, and this bill seeks to strike that balance. Oh, I, I, do, do, we, do we have a follow-up? Okay. No. Representative Sparks. Yeah, I'm just, I was just thinking this would make a great discussion for a classroom, social studies or something to see the debate. Because um, what the chairman brought up was a good points. I brought this up to the folks that were calling me. Um, but I think we did see an overreach when you look at COVID. Uh, I'm reminded of the guardsmen that were calling me that were going to get out of the guard, you know, people that had been in there for years. I'm just going to quote, quote our governor. Uh, dealing with the uh, vaccine mandate. He said, for months, Tennessee has pushed back against federal COVID vaccine mandates placed on members of our military and our efforts have paid off, said Governor Bill Lee in July, called on the Biden administration to exempt members of the Tennessee National Guard as a matter of national security and state preparedness. And I recently led 20, 20 fellow Republican governors in a letter urging Congress to appeal the overreaching mandate. Thank you to Senator Blackburn and Tennessee's congressional de delegation, our troops, who can remain focused on their mission to defend Americans at home. I do understand the, the, the chairman's uh, comments, um, but I've also seen um, things that are encroaching on our right to choose, on our personal freedoms and liberty. Um, you know, that employer also cannot employ that, that person. And um, uh, I'm going to vote for you, Bill, but I understand the chairman's uh, concern, but I've, we've seen the overreach the past two years that I've never think, think we'd ever see as a Tennessean businesses closing down, people losing their jobs. It, it's, it's overreach. Our freedoms are being encroached upon each and every day. I'm going to support you, Bill, sir. Representative Barrett, did you have a comment? Thank you, Representative Sparks, for your comments. Representative Lynn, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just wanted to say, too, that um, religious exemption and truly whatever religion you are, it generally has to do with some vaccines have fetal stem cells in them. And um, there are folks, they, they don't even have to be religious. They just have to be, um, you know, of an ethical mindset where that's not okay with them. And to be forced to be vaccinated um, just to work um, is, 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 is something that is going to be very hard uh, for these people. And we tend, we will be excluding people from society um, because they have that, ex, you know, objection. And then with the M, 
NRA um, new vaccines that are coming out, they, the intent is to, uh, you know, somehow manipulate your DNA. So then again, a religious exemption there makes sense because people do not, I'm, I'm fine with what I was born with, I'm okay. And a lot of people feel that way and they don't want to be forced. I think what we've seen with COVID is an unbelievable coordination between the media, government, and very rich people who own or own interest in vaccine companies. And uh, now we've seen some of them have divested themselves and now they're backing off. Oh, the vaccine wasn't so good. It didn't protect people and it didn't. You, it, that vaccine didn't keep you from getting it, um, didn't keep you from spreading it, and didn't keep you out of the hospital. So what was it all about? I don't know. But in my district, there are several people, and t including um, one of my husband's and I best friends. He worked for a country music star for 26 years, didn't put in a religious exemption, and got fired anyway. And that's hard when you lose a career like that. It is very hard. And people have been working for thousands of years. We didn't have vaccines. Most people will get the typical vaccines, but those unusual ones um, where they are using maybe stem cells or manipulating, um, seeking to manipulate your DNA, people really have a problem with it. And the overreaching of these very powerful uh, companies putting pressure on uh, regular people, just regular us, we're, we're just little people, we just want to go to work and work, has been unprecedented. And you just wonder, is this going to continue in the future? I think we need to offer some protection for people against that kind of horrible overreach because they really wrecked people's lives. They really wrecked people's lives and for nothing because the vaccine didn't protect you from getting COVID, spreading COVID, or keep you out of the hospital. So what was it all about? Their lives, their livelihoods, their careers are now wrecked. And it is, it is just a darn shame. And I, I support this legislation because I, I think it's, it's time that us in Tennessee, we push back for the little guy and um, you know we say, we're gonna help you out. Even the pertussis vaccine, the pertussis vaccine does not prevent spread of pertussis. It doesn't. You can still get it and spread it. And do we get pertussis vaccines? Yes, I'm vaccinated, yes, I am. But the selling of the vaccines has been very unethical and it hasn't entirely been truthful. And so I really feel that we need to protect the little guy in this state whose lives are being ruined by very large, powerful companies and media coordinating all together with government, uh, coordinating all that all together and ruining their lives. Thank you, and I, I have to disagree with you a little bit. I've been fully vaccinated and boosted and I've only had COVID twice. So. <laughs> okay, the next and uh, Chairman Faison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee, uh, I'm not really going to argue the, the merits of the bill. I have a concern. Over the last three years, I've, I always teach freshman classes. They come in, and I'm huge on our rules of procedure. I'm huge on respecting the institution of the legislature and what has worked. Right before committee started, I had lobbyists from the THA say, hey, we've got an amendment coming to this bill that we're going to agree with. So just for me, regardless of how I feel about the bill, when I hear that there's a potential amendment coming to a bill that's somewhat controversial in the first place, I, I'm one of these guys who feel like we should keep a bill in subcommittee, fix it correctly if there's interested parties before we move it to full committee. And, and that's been the safest way for us to practice my 13 years being here. So I just want to bring that up. I didn't know if the rest of the committee was aware of that conversation. Just want y'all to hear that. Okay, uh, Representative Barrett, do you want to comment? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's not currently a, a, an amendment suggested for this bill. 
there's been comments uh, and meetings that have taken place with different people that have different interests about this bill, but nothing has been presented. Uh, the only comment that I have made as the sponsor of the bill is that if anyone wants to present an amendment and have me take a look at it, I am open to that. But as we sit here today, no amendment has been drafted. No amendment has been suggested. No specific language has been brought to me. So I have no reason to roll this bill or ask this committee to do anything other, to consider anything other than what is before you today. And I would like to go back just to address uh, Representative Lynn's comments about vaccines in general. This is not a vaccine bill. This is an individual liberty bill. This is this. This bill says nothing about the efficacy of vaccines, uh, which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones work, which ones don't, whether you should get them, whether you shouldn't. This is strictly trying to balance the individual liberties between an employer and an employee when it comes to requirements of what an employee must do with their body. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Representative Lynn, your name was called. Well, thank you, and I, I didn't mean to muddy the waters like that, but I, I too, have thought long and hard about this, and I, I, I just think that we need to stick up for the little guy and um, over the unbelievable things we've seen happen over the last three years. So thank you. Thank you, and uh, Leader Camper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for letting me do a follow-up. Uh, Mr. Sponsor, in reading the... Um, legislation and subparagraph B under, I think, uh, where are we? A in subparagraph B. It says that the um, employer have to accept written notice from the employee and they can't question it. They just have to take it on face value and they sign a written document saying that they want to be um, exempt. And so my question is, what happens if that document is a false document? Say some, they signed it, yes, but they weren't being truthful on the document. Would the employer have some type of uh, repercussion, I mean, um, uh, uh, standing to file a lawsuit or something against them? I mean, how do the employer deal with a falsified document under this legislation because they can't question it they just have to accept it representative barrett thank you mr chairman again thank you for the question yeah uh, th the bill ensures that there's no religious test given uh as to a person's religiously held beliefs concerning their religious objection, and that's what that provision of the bill is for. Oh. It would be similar to uh, a landlord or a housing authority requiring someone to verify their disability that requires them to have a comfort animal in their house. You can't do that. <laughs> and, and same thing here. If an employee raises a religious exemption, there has to be protection that that employee is not then given an inquisition that they have to prove that they have this truly held religious belief. That's just, a again, if we want to talk about slippery slopes, then the slippery slope of trying to get people to ha have to prove what it is they believe or have faith in, uh, that's something that's been going on since the dawn of human existence, and I don't think that we want to try to start legislating that. Thank you. Leader Camper, did you have a follow-up? I don't. Okay. Um, Representative, I'm sorry. Yeah, Representative Garrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Barrett, for bringing this legislation because I guess to, what, pre-COVID, I don't know if this was a conversation that people had, whether or not vaccinations were question on its efficacy or whether or not they were right or wrong or whether or not we had an issue of being exempt for various reasons, right? Then we have a period of time where our federal government made it so difficult that they made us do some things. They made businesses do this. And I think people are, are concerned about that. What's going to look like from here down the road, right, when there's no answer for uh, a vaccination? I've met with um, several folks of the 
over the past couple of weeks, um, I've received emails probably like you all have that are both, well, that are for this legislation. I've met with no one from any business group, from any medical group. No one has knocked on my door and said they're not for this legislation. They don't, they don't like it. No one. And so um, since this legislation has been out there, and so with, with that coupled with what happened during COVID being forced to our businesses being forced to make the decision of whether or not their employees, uh, which I believe was a gross overreach of the federal government's authority, um, I, I see no problem with there being some sort of an exemption, whether it's a religious or another issue with with an exemption to being vaccinated to work in this country. So, so I certainly don't want to make our businesses, you know, any regulated more or regulated less or force a mandate on business. Believe me, that's not what we are about here. But this isn't about us. This is about what the federal government told us to do for two years, 18 months. And now we're seeing all kinds of issues with this COVID vaccine uh, because it was you know, done under emergency use and people were forced to take that. And it's now woken folks up to realize, do we need all of these vaccines? And is there data out there that says that they work or not work? But then they're forced to do it anyway in whatever job they are trying to to get. So so that, those are my issues with was I didn't know where I was on this legislation, uh, but but thinking this through over the past two years, we didn't have COVID at all. This would probably be something that I wouldn't support. But I think COVID has made it where people are now concerned about what's the federal government going to make us do next. So I think this sends a message and maybe it sends another message if this becomes law of how we're going to deal with this if someone doesn't want to take a shot. However, I, I do agree with our chairman when you are on a construction site. I've had a tetanus shot. I've, I've, I've ran into a barbed wire fence and that was the first thing and that that did nothing to me. And so I, I get that balance and I think we need we need to find one because I, I agree with his statement that that rang true to me but but uh, but I don't know what that answer is uh, other than at least them having an option so I appreciate the legislation I'll be supporting it representative Barrett thank you and I appreciate your support chairman Vaughn allow me to address my colleague from whatever county Johnny Garrett's in from. <laughs> now you've called his name. Yeah. Oh, I like to hear him talk. <laughs> you said that this won't give us any protections from federal government overreach again. It won't. What this is going to do is it's us reaching into businesses and saying that you don't control your workplace. We do. That's a concern for me. Now then, what we, we have a freedom to disagree. That's one of the things that, that I think that has been lost is, is our society trends towards a binary world. You're a one or you're a zero. You're in this silo or you're this silo. We've lost the ability to disagree. People become enemies because they disagree. And it, that's unfortunate because in this case, it's not a binary choice, at least not for me, because I understand the point that... that uh, Representative sitting next to you from her county, from Wilson County, <laughs> brought up about the stem cell and fetal cell in, in that exemption. I have, a, I'm, I'm okay. I understand that. That's something that I, I could see how somebody objects to that. The mRNA technology and what we, the bill of goods that we got sold with COVID uh, has created a healthy dose of skepticism within us all. And one and and I am. I took one of those vaccines because and my wife celebrates every day that she didn't calls me the dummy. <laughs> and that's what good wives do, don't they celebrate their victories <laughs> over their husbands? Um, and but I was precluded because I didn't take any more from participating in activities. I understand that and, and its efficacy and what it was tended to do, it may have stemmed the tide early in the fight against COVID, but I think that I, I don't think that we uh, we fully realize exactly what it did. And so, if this had to do with mRNA technology, I'd be cool with it. But what happens is we're starting down to where employees can tell employers, "I can't do that. I can't do that," and why? Um, my religious exemption. And that, does it come next to operating a piece of machinery? 
what exactly, where do we stop with it? And so I appreciate the fact of the individual liberty portion of this. I do. But where, what about the individual liberties of the small business owner who may have a, a family member that's immunocompromised? It's just a situation to where, and it's very unique. And so, like I said, I don't disagree with all parts of his bill. I just agree with us taking a step off the porch down into this murk of, of where does individual liberty, and there's some that I understand that say it's above all, but we do live in a society to where some people's individual liberties infringe upon other people's individual liberties, and that's why government exists, is to sort all this out. But I just, I, I would think, I would like to see this thing wordsmith some more to where we take out, we take a common sense approach to it because the fact that we're any and all are used in here with regards to vaccines, I think that's, that's something that is of concern to me. And then again, the principle of the matter, which is us stepping into this world and getting and telling a business how to treat, how, how to deal with this issue, because sometimes it may infringe upon the building, the business owner's individual rights the same way as it does the employee rights. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. And I'll hush and I'll, you know, we have a committee system. And if we agree to disagree, we'll rock on and, and live to fight another day. But that's, that's my position. Okay. Thank you, Representative Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I completely understand where the chairman's coming from. As an employer with 14 employees, I completely understand that the worry and concern about dictating it, I don't want to say this in a disrespectful way, but allowing the inmates to run the, the asylum. I get it. I understand. However, with that being said, our Constitution protects our individual right to worship. Article 1, Section 3 of the Tennessee Constitution says that all men have a natural and indefeasible right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience, and that no human authority can, in any case whatever, control or interfere with the rights of conscience. That's no human authority, including a business owner. And so that being said, I, I go back to what I've said from the beginning, this is about individual liberties of an employer versus an employee and trying to, to find that balance where both have an equal say in, what, in how their individual liberty is affected by the other. Thank you. Representative Garrett. You're good? Okay. Yeah. Representative Lynn. We, or both we of look you. Alike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we look alike. We look a lot alike. So... Um, you know, to me, this bill is more than about religion. It's also about individual liberty and someone forcing you to put something in your body. And, you know, what if we got to the point where an employer decided, I'm going to force my employees to get a tattoo or I'm going to enfor force my employees to get some sort of ring around them or I'm going to force my employees to drink this tonic because this tonic makes you work better, swifter, um, stronger, whatever. It's called coffee. Right. If, if <laughs> that is true. Not everybody likes coffee. Not a, but what if we got to the point where things like that happen? It's about individual liberty, and if someone's making you put something into your body, and to me, that's where this is different. It's not about wearing the company T-shirt or, you know, doing the company training or something about, about that. It's about putting something into your body, and that is a very uh, strong individual liberty marker for me. We we got to we got to stick up for the little guy and and not let that happen. Thank you, Representative Sparks. I don't, I don't want to 
reiterate the point, but I keep this First Amendment card with me at all times, and um, I've got several of them, anybody wants one. I do think the First Amendment's under attack. You don't see the media. The media's not gonna cover this issue, Representative Barrett. This is an important issue. It is talking about freedom, it's talking about liberty. But one thing I wanna say for the record, I think COVID is real. I think there has been people that have passed away. I see a young lady in the audience right now that potentially probably saved one of our members' lives. I'm not gonna go into detail, just nod your head. You're nodding your head. I'm not going to go into detail. She may not want me to share that story, but um, that member helped, that, that young lady right there helped one of our members get in the hospital. You probably saved his life, but that member had to have a liver transplant. He was in bad shape, bless his heart. We're talking about David Bird. But um, I do admire our, chair, our chairman of full committee. Hopefully we get this worked out if it comes out of this committee and his concerns are addressed. I'm a, I'm, I agree with that guy 99% of the time on this one. I have to disagree, but I say let's move this bill on out to full committee. Uh, Representative Baird, did you have a comment? No, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to have a, a question for you too. I guess my question, my, my main concern, and I've, and I've mentioned this to you, was the health care providers. And looking at the bill, and I'm going to go out of session and, and let legal clarify this, but to me, I see where they have to provide reasonable accommodation, but I'm not seeing where health care providers uh, would be exempt from this bill. And so I'm going to go in, uh, out of session just for a moment and ask legal to clarify that and see, if, uh, see what she says about it, okay? Thank you. We're out of session and going to legal, and would you please... Give your name and... Um, Love and Middleton Legal Services. Um, so under subsection D, it states that a healthcare provider does not violate this section if reasonable accommodation measures are implemented and provided to a person who files a statement of religious objection in order to protect the safety and health of other persons from communicable diseases. Um, I don't know if I would say that's a, a full exemption because it... it does seem like they would still have to um, comply with the section, but uh, if, if they implement reasonable accommodations, then they're not in violation of the section, but um, that's that's the extent of, of it, so. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions for legal while we're out of session? Okay, if not, we're gonna go back in session. I'm going to uh, make a motion that we roll this bill one week and, and get some clarifying language on the health care provider part, the exemption, because I'm not really comfortable with that. Other than that, I'm okay with the bill. But if, uh, if that's okay, can I um, I'm make the motion that we do roll it one week and get some clarification on that and maybe some language that will clear that up. Okay, and we've got a motion and a second. Any objection? All in favor say aye. I'll oppose. Bills roll one week. And that is all. Thank you all for coming out. We appreciate your attention, and uh, thanks for coming. There's a gift bag at the back door back there.